Hey guys, when it comes to pet snakes, mill snakes are among the most popular and the most widely sold reptiles in the pet industry. Their moderate size, bright vivid colors, and their mild dispositions make them popular with both children and adults. In this video, we're going to show you how to both select and care for these popular reptile pets. So milk snakes are a member of the family of snakes known as colubrids. Now they're the genus Lampropeltis, which means they're closely related to the king snakes. We're going to talk about the care requirements of three popular subspecies, the Cinnaloin milk snake, the Nelson's milk snake, and their larger cousin, the Honduran milk snake. Now first of all, when we're talking about selecting a pet, we want to say right off the bat that we are very, very adamant that you're going to be better off with a captive born and bred animal. A captive born animal from a breeder is going to be your best bet. Much more hardy animals than one that you're going to go out and capture from the wild. Not to mention the personalities of captive born animals are usually quite a bit more docile than their wild counterparts. So when it comes to pet reptiles, these guys are very popular because of their moderate size. Now two of the subspecies, the Cinnaloin and the Nelson, are on your smaller end, meaning that adult sizes are typically under four feet in length. However, the Honduran milk snake is a little bit bigger. They can attain adult lengths of up to six feet, and they're a little bit thicker through the body than both the Nelson and the Cinnaloin. When it comes to selection, you're also going to get to select many different color morphs of these animals. You've got the normal type or the wild type, the albinos, the hypomelanistics, anatheristics, and combinations of those two genes, such as the ghost. Also in the Honduran milk snake, there are two naturally occurring color variations, one being the tangerines, the other being the tricolor, and you have combinations of other genetic morphs, such as albino tricolors, or albino tangerines, or hypotangerines, and so forth. When it comes to choosing a color, that is strictly a personal preference, and the care of these animals is not going to change at all depending on the color pattern morph. What I mean by that is a wild type coloration is going to have the same care requirements as is a hypomelanistic or even maybe a tangerine hypo. The only variation to that could possibly be the albinos. You want to use a little bit of caution with albinos because their skin doesn't have any melon in it. For that reason, we caution you not to take an albino snake outside for natural sunlight simply because their skin can burn very, very easily because of the lack of melon. Now, there's a a lot of people out there that will go to a reptile show or they'll go online and they'll make a purchase of an animal and then their next question to us is usually now what do I need to buy for the animal to live in we believe that's a little bit of what they call putting the cart before the horse what we want you to do is to go ahead and prepare a suitable home in which your animal is going to live before you actually make the purchase we're going to show you two schools of thought here on how to house your pet milk snake okay so before you make a decision on what type of setup you want, the first thing you're going to want to choose is going to be the actual cage itself. Now, there are actually two different kinds that we're going to recommend. One of those is a sliding top, such as this cage right here, where the screen door actually slides in from the top of the cage and it latches like so. The other style of cage is going to have a screen on the top, but it's going to have doors on the front here. Now, each one of these cages has their advantages and their disadvantages and it depends on the rest of your setup which one of these styles you're going to want to choose. For demonstration purposes in this video we're going to use the sliding top cage here and the next thing you're going to want to consider is how you're going to heat your cage. Now reptiles are ectothermic or what we refer to as cold-blooded so therefore they're going to need an external source of heat to allow their body to warm up to optimal temperature for things 
like digestion to take place. In the reptile hobby, there is basically two uh, more popular ways of heating your reptile. One is to heat them from below the cage, what is referred to as belly heat, and the other way of heating cages is to heat the animal from above. To heat a cage from below, you're gonna wanna use something like one of these heating pads right here. Now, the advantage of a heating pad is that it actually goes on the outside bottom of the cage. You're gonna wanna place it at one side or the other. We don't recommend placing the heat pad right in the middle of the cage. The reason being you want to create a gradient heat. In other words, you want the cage to be really warm on one end, moderately warm in the middle, and cooler on the other end. That allows your snake to move throughout its environment to thermoregulate its body to whatever it needs at that particular time. So with one of these, you want to raise your cage up and stick it right on the bottom of the cage like so, and then place your cage back down. Now, I wanna caution you about these things. Most of these under tank heating pads get really, really warm. So what I'm gonna recommend is the use of, at very least, a dimmer switch, which means you're gonna plug this into a dimming switch and cut the power back on your heating pad so that it's not really hot to the touch. Just for that heating pad to be mildly warm to the touch will be sufficient for a milk snake. Plug this in and then set your dimmer switch accordingly so that the heating pad in its bare area is just warm to the human touch. Now, another popular way of heating a reptile is to actually do it from above. Now, by that means we usually put some type of uh, basking bulb in a light fixture like this and set it on the screen on the top of the cage. Now, this is gonna be a little bit problematic for a cage like this. And the reason is because the screen opens from the top. That means every time you open this cage to go in it, you're gonna have to find something to do with this light. Now you wanna think fire prevention because you can't take a hot bulb off and set it down on carpet or on a tablecloth or something because that will create a fire hazard. Now that's where those cages that open from the front actually have the advantage over this style of cage because you can leave a light on the top of the cage open it from the front without the need to remove the light bulb each and every time the cage is open. Now, I'm not a big fan of high, high basking temperatures for milk snakes. As a matter of fact, we don't let any of our milk snakes basking spots get over 85 degrees. We found that at 85 degrees, our animals are able to digest food without becoming stressed out due to being over, overly heated. So for that, mean, for that reason, we recommend the basking spot to stay around 84, 85 degrees maximum and allow the other end of the cage to stay down in a cooler area of about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If your basking spot's too hot, simply cut the bulb wattage down. Let's say you start with a 60 watt bulb and your basking spot's getting to be 90 degrees, simply go down to a 50 watt bulb and then test your temperatures again. If you're at a 40 watt bulb and your basking temperature is 80 degrees, you might want to kick it up a couple of watts on that bulb. Now, one of the questions some people are gonna have is do snakes require UVB light? And the fact of the matter is they do not. However, if you want to use full spectrum lighting, I will tell you that your cage will look more bright, it'll be lit up more vividly, um, your animal's coloration will come out a lot more. Although UVB is not required for the animal's health, if you wanna use an UVB light just for the visual aesthetics of it, then by all means you certainly can. However, once again, I would caution you to probably do away with UVB if your snake happens to be an albino. So the next thing we're gonna talk about after we've got our cage sufficiently heated is the type of substrate that your snake's gonna live on. Now, there's a lot of options out there, but I wanna caution you right off the bat about one that you definitely wanna stay away from, cedar shavings. By all means, do not, we repeat, do not put cedar shavings into your reptile cages. Now the stuff smells really good and you may be tempted to do it because of the scent. However, cedar is highly toxic to snakes 
and I promise you, your animals are not going to fare well living on cedar bedding. So the first thing we're going to do is set up a cage, what we call a naturalistic looking cage. Now this cage is going to be more visually pleasing to you, the owner. It doesn't really make a difference to your snake. As long as their basic needs are met, we don't think they really care one way or the other. Now we talked about different cage substrates and I warned you about the cedar shavings, but when it comes to natural looking, one of my personal favorites is what's called cypress mulch. Cypress mulch has some good advantages in that this stuff doesn't really mold and rot uh, very quickly like some of the other uh, wood shavings out there and it looks naturally pleasing. So we're going to go ahead and put some in the bottom of our terrarium here. Basically what you want is about an inch to maybe two inches of substrate on the bottom of your cage floor. Now, one of the things that snakes like to do is hide. So don't be surprised if the vast majority of time your snakes are gonna crawl underneath the substrate and hide. Now when it comes to water, your snake's gonna wanna drink water quite obviously, and you're gonna need to place something in here in which your snake's gonna drink out of. Now, if you wanna stay with the more naturalistic looking, there's a lot of commercially available bowls like this that kinda of look like a rock. Um, and you can fill these things with water and place them in the cage somewhere. Now, one of the things that we like to do, even when setting up a naturalistic looking cage, I like these ceramic water crops because they're easy to clean and disinfect. Um, although they don't look that natural, one of the things that we like to do is to actually remove the bedding from a certain area, place our water crop in, and then pack the wood shavings back around the bowl to kind of camouflage it a little bit so it's not quite so noticeable. And it provides a place for your snake to drink or to soak. Now, one other thing that you may want to put in your cage, and like I said, snakes are usually going to use the substrate to hide, but there's a lot of commercially available hide such as this one right here that actually acts has like this little cave area here your snake can hide in something else you'll see available in a lot of pet stores is these little half pieces of wood they look natural like they belong in the environment but it gives your snake a place to hide in these are commercially available certainly nothing wrong with using them as long as you can keep them clean and disinfected now in reptile cages we do recommend a humidity cave or a humidity hide box. If you're going for the naturalistic approach, one of the things that you can do when you put this in there is you remember your heat pad is on this side of the cage. Place your hide box over your heat pad. Simply take a spray bottle and just lightly mist the substrate over the top of your heating pad and then place your log over the top where you missed it at. As that heat pad warms up, that water will evaporate inside this log, creating a microclimate inside the snake's cage so that he can move under here when his body requires higher humidity, uh, such as right before a snake sheds its skin. Now, another thing that I like to add to a cage if I'm gonna use a naturalistic approach is simply pieces of driftwood. And it doesn't really matter how you set these up. The only purpose they serve is to give the cage a more natural look, is to take pieces of driftwood such as this and just place them in the cage however you want to. And if you can situate these in certain areas, if you're using a basking light, on the top of your cage to warm the cage, one of the advantages of having driftwood is that they create an elevated platform so that your snake can climb up and get closer to its basking bulb or it can move down the driftwood to get further away and cool its body off. One final thing you may want to consider with a naturalistic vivarium is to cover the back with some type of natural looking material. Now, they're commercially available uh, terrarium backings that look like the forest. We recommend putting those along the back and two sides of the cage so that the snake only has one glass area for viewing and that way he doesn't feel like he's got people walking all around him constantly looking at him from all directions. 
We believe that it will aid to the visual appearance of the cage and it'll also lend itself to helping your animal feel more secure when it doesn't have glass all the way around it. If you do utilize this cage set up in a natural way, we do recommend the use of a separate tub to feed your snake in so that the animal doesn't swallow cage substrate when he's eating his food. Now, there's another school of thought that goes away from the naturalistic approach. This approach right here is one that's going to work, especially if you have several animals in your reptile collection and you need to clean them all very, very quickly. So far as a cage substrate goes, in this approach, you're usually going to use something like newspaper or better yet, even a non-printed white butcher paper type stuff. Basically, you're just going to cut a piece of this to size and place it down in the bottom of the cage. I wanna go ahead and tell you, don't be surprised if your animal finds a little crevice somewhere where he can get underneath it and he'll actually spend the vast majority of his time laying underneath the newspaper. The fact remains that snakes are secretive animals and they're gonna seek out places where they can hide in secret and there's no better place in the cage than underneath the newspaper. The next thing you wanna consider is how is your snake gonna drink? Now, there's a couple of different things that you can use and it just depends on your budget and what you wanna do. Now, commercially available there are these bowls like this here this is a ceramic type crock bowl and uh, these things are readily available in pet shops we also have some of these available for sale on our website the advantage to these is that when they get sold you can simply take them out throw them in the dishwasher and you can wash them that way we do recommend having two of these that way you can have one in the cage while the other one's being washed and you can swap them out as needed you're on a limited budget and you want to water your snake a little cheaper something that you can use is recycle these little tubs like these cool whip jars and all this the one disadvantage to using something like this though is because they are lightweight if your snake crawls up on the side it is going to flip that bowl over even if it has water in it so you're probably going to find you're having to clean up spills a lot more if using something like this but i will share one little tip with you something that you can do take a knife and cut a little hole leave the top on pour the water in and now with the top on it's less likely to spill one of the things that we do recommend is that you keep the water bowl off of the heating pad so if your heating pads on this end go ahead and place your water bowl on the opposite end the reason is you don't want to raise the humidity up too much uh, because then you give a place for bacteria to grow if your humidity levels are too high so after you've got your bowl in place you've got your heat pad you've got your basking light or whatever you choose to use you want to think about giving your snakes some security now like I said before snakes are gonna hide under the substrate but something you can give your snakes is a hide box or a place to hide now one of the things with baby snakes that we like to use is this little box right here it is a hide box for snakes and it gives a door that's offset from the center so that your snake can come in and feel a little more secure in it but the other thing that we like about these is the fact that it has a top that opens and there is a humidity chamber inside here now the way this basically works is you're going to take these two sponges that are inside here and you're going to dip them down in some water you want to wring those out and place them back in place what that's going to do is create not only a hide box for your snake to come and hide in but it's also going to give him a microclimate where the humidity underneath here is going to be much higher than it is throughout the rest of the cage that way it allows the animal to seek out that microclimate if it needs higher humidity for things like shedding its skin for example we do have these available on our site if you want to purchase one of these if you buy a snake from us we can ship you one of these with your snake and not cost you any additional shipping however if you already have a snake and you want one of these we do have them available on our website now when we're talking about these various approaches and we're talking about recycling cool whip jars or things like this for water bowls something else you can do to recycle some household items is to give your snake a hide box that is basically just an old box like this you would be surprised 
that how many reptile keepers before a lot of things were commercially available, such as hide boxes, utilize things like this for their snakes. And I can tell you this, snakes don't care whether it's a plastic box or a paper box. The advantage of using something like this in the cage is that they're cheap, they're readily available. You can get some second use out of it before it goes into the garbage. And if your snake happens to soil it, simply take it out, toss it in the trash and replace it with a new one. Either way it goes, whether you're using something like this for a hide and this for a water bowl, or if you're using more commercially available stuff such as a water bowl and a hide. This right here is simplicity in and of itself. Simply if the bowl gets dirty, take it out, wash it, replace it with a different bowl. If the hide gets dirty, simply take it out, replace it. When the cage gets soiled, simply take the paper out, wad it up, throw it in the trash and replace it with a clean paper. Now in this generation of reptile keepers, I know there's somebody out there watching that's thinking to themselves right now, well what about enrichment? What is the snake going to do for enrichment? Well, that's where you're going to come in. You're going to take your animal out. You're going to play with it. You're going to hold it. You're going to do things with that animal to enrich it. This type of cage setup is only for the basic necessities that the snake needs to survive to be met. And there's nothing wrong with something like this. There's a lot of people out there in the Facebook groups that are going to say, well, that's not the way I would do things and therefore it's wrong. But we're not going to be one of those people that tell you that unless you do it our way, your way is wrong. There are many ways to keep an animal and most of those ways are good as long as they meet the animal's necessities requirements for survival and there's nothing wrong with a setup like this although we do encourage you to interact regularly with your animal so that it does remain calm and it does give your animal some enrichment daily now like we said when we were talking about the more natural looking uh, vivarium you might want to consider blocking off three of the sides and if you're not worried about how it looks you can do it by simply using a piece of the paper that you use for substrate, uh, just by simply taping it onto the back and the two sides, and your snake once again will feel more secure, not having glass all the way around it. So in this part of the video, we're gonna talk a little bit about feeding. Now when it comes to feeding milk snakes, they seldom ever pose a problem eating in captivity, and that's especially so if you've bought a captive born and raised specimen, which we would highly encourage you to do. Now, as far as how often you should feed your snake, hatchling snakes will usually start feeding about 10 days after they've hatched. They'll go through their very first shed cycle, and then a day or so after their first shed cycle, they'll usually take their very first meal. Now, we start our milk snakes off on frozen thawed pinky mice, and we hope to get them eating frozen thawed mice for the duration of their lives. So we go ahead and start them off on that in the very beginning. So when it comes to feeding frequency, the thing is basically general recommendation is that you feed your baby snake at least once every five to seven days. Now, obviously you can feed them more often than that, uh, if you want your snakes to grow faster, but if you offer too much food, you do risk your baby snake regurgitating if they eat too much. So our general recommendation is anywhere between every five and every seven days, you want to offer your snake a pinky mouse. If after you fed it a pink mouse, it acts like it's still hungry, and you can tell because it'll kind of follow you around the cage and look like it's anticipating something else to eat, you can go ahead and give it a second pinky mouse. Now, once your snake begins feeding on two pinky mice, you might want to go up in size to maybe a peach fuzzy. Once they're eating two peach fuzzies, you can go up in size to a fuzzy and so forth. Now, as your snake reaches adulthood, your feeding frequency can cut back to once every seven to 10 days. Now, keep in mind that during shedding cycles, when the snakes go into blue, and you'll notice this because their eyes will take on a cloudy appearance and their skin looks dull and not as bright and vivid as it looks most of the time. Generally speaking, snakes don't feed during that shed cycle. Although there are some exceptions to that rule, there are some snakes that will feed right up until the day they shed and they'll never go off feed for shedding. Most of the time, once the eyes become cloudy, the snakes just typically don't feed at that time. Now, speaking of feeding adults, 
If you have one of the smaller uh, subspecies like the sinaloin, your snake's probably gonna eat one to two adult mice every seven to 10 days if it's an adult. But if you have one of the, I say one of the larger subspecies like the Honduran milk, for example, you might even go up to a small to medium sized rat once every seven to 10 days. Or if you're feeding mice, you could go up to maybe two, possibly even three adult mice and so forth. Just keep an eye out that your snake doesn't get obese. Um, they should look well filled out, firm and healthy, but you don't want them to look like a stuffed sausage. So adjust your feeding as needed to keep your snakes healthy and well fed, but not obese, which is unhealthy in and of itself. So let's talk for a moment about feeding problems. Now, once again, if you bought a captive born snake, you shouldn't have any issues with feeding, but occasionally you may have a snake that wants to go off feed. One of the reasons for that could possibly be simply that it's getting cooler, it's coming into winter time. Sometimes snakes that are kept cool will want to go into a hibernation state. The easiest way to take care of that is to increase the day cycle. Uh, maybe you might need to turn some artificial lighting on in the room where the snakes are kept to make the daytime a little longer each day and also to keep your snake warm. Every now and then you'll have a problem with regurgitation where a milk snake will eat something and will not fully digest it and will throw it back up. That's usually caused by one or two things. Either the snake was fed too much to begin with or the temperature was too cool and the snake doesn't have the ability to digest its meal because of too cool of temperature. Other than that, there's typically not many problems associated with feeding milk snakes. Milk snakes do feed readily even on frozen thawed rodents. Speaking of frozen thaw, when it comes to feeding, that's kind of a personal preference. Now, if you go online, you're gonna read a lot of pluses about feeding frozen thaw. Some people that are more naturalistic, they believe that snakes should only be fed live. My personal opinion is it's your snake, it's your preference. The only thing I would caution you about is if you do choose to feed your snake live, you wanna be sure to watch the snake and make sure it eats. If you leave a live adult mouse or a live rat in a cage with a snake uneaten, don't be surprised at night when the temperatures drop down in your snake's enclosure, the prey can then become the predator. Rats have attacked snakes and sometimes it simply doesn't fare very well for the snake. Now when it comes time to decide what you wanna feed your snake, one of the questions that you wanna ask whoever you buy your snake from is what is that animal currently feeding on? Now good respectable breeders will keep feeding records of every snake that they produce. Now here at our facility, we don't offer a snake up for sale until it's had a history of feeding on frozen thawed. So you might wanna check with the breeder that you're buying your snake from so that they can tell you how that snake has a history of feeding. If you wanna feed your snake frozen thawed, you might wanna make sure that the breeder already has it on frozen thawed before you make the purchase. However, if you wanna feed it live, generally speaking, it's not gonna matter. A snake that's been used to feeding on frozen thawed will oftentimes go ahead and feed on live if it's given the opportunity. However, a snake that has a history of feeding live, a lot of times will be very difficult to convert them over to frozen thawed, especially by someone who has little experience in doing so. So now you've got your cage set up, you've got the home for your snake, you have figured out what you wanna feed it, and now is time to bring your snake home and of course, you're gonna to wanna to handle. Now there's a lot of talk out there about enrichment. My personal opinion is enrichment needs to take place outside of the snake's cage. That is where you and I as keepers interact with our animals on a regular basis. I don't put a lot of thought into cage enrichment simply because I like to interact with my snakes. The interaction is providing that snake with a lot of enrichment. All the things that it gets to smell, the feel, the touch, the handling, the moving about, the seeing things that it wouldn't see inside of its cage is gonna provide your snake with tons of enrichment once once you take it out. And when it comes to baby snakes, milk snakes are squirrely. The reason is simply this. 
in the animal kingdom, there's basically two rules of thought. Either the thing that is messing with me is small enough and I can eat it and therefore it's prey, or it's large enough that it can eat me and therefore it's predator. So don't be surprised when you reach in to grab your baby milk snake, it sees you as a predator and it will oftentimes strike out and bite you simply because they're trying to protect themselves. Snakes are not inherently born to know that we are not a threat. When they're young, they haven't had a lot of experience with humans and therefore they're frightened by us and they will act accordingly. However, with consistent handling and patience, you'll soon find that your milk snake will calm down. They'll stop doing the squirrely wiggling and the running away. By the time your milk snake gets to be an adult, you can practically sit on the couch and watch TV with it laying beside you. Speaking of bites, there are two things that are gonna get you bit by a milk snake. The first of those being fear. A milk snake's gonna strike out and bite because you stick your hand in. Now, for that reason, especially with baby milk snakes, we recommend removing your snake from its cage with a snake hook if possible, or something that's not just this big hand moving in toward them and scaring them. Once you get the snake out of the cage, just let it crawl around in your open palm so that it feels a little bit more secure. Once the snake gets where it can trust you, then you can simply open the cage and remove the snake with your bare hand. The second reason that you're gonna get bit by a milk snake is because you smell like it's food. That means if you've been sitting around playing with your hamster or your gerbil, and all of a sudden you reach into your milk snake's cage and you get bit, well it's probably because he mistook the smell of you for something that it would normally eat. Also keep in mind that milk snakes are closely related to their cousins, the king snakes, and they do sometimes eat other snakes. For that reason, we recommend you only house one milk snake per cage at any given time to avoid one of your milk snakes preying on the other one. But also, if you have another snake in your collection, you might wanna wash your hands after you handle that snake before you pick up your milk snake so that he doesn't smell the other snake on your hand and mistake you once again for a food item. All right guys, so we're gonna wrap this video up in conclusion simply by saying we appreciate so much you guys coming to YouTube to watch our videos. Thank you so much for that. Please share them with your family and your friends. Also, I wanna say that if you're considering a milk snake, please check out our website. I'm gonna put a link down in the description below. We have several milk snakes that are available. And once again, we don't even offer them up for sale until they have a history of feeding on frozen thawed. We do a flat rate shipping pretty much anywhere in the country for the same price for up to three animals. We do thank you for watching this video. Hope you have a great week. Keep on herping, guys. Most popular and most widely sold, not most, hang on, do it again, check. Which means they're first cousins. <laughs> the largest of these three subspecies, and that's, and that's what we're gonna be, I believe, believe, believe. the Honduran milk snake. Oh! Wow.